Uh, my name is Glenn LaBeouf. Uh, I'm a history nut, a history nut since I was 14. Uh, I know you, a lot of you read uh, novels. I never really got into that other than Ray Bradbury. But because uh, reading about actual history is always more interesting to me because it, it actually happened. These people actually lived. And today is Abraham Lincoln's birthday. He was born today in 1809. And he would be pretty much the two essential people uh, that some people say miraculously or just by circumstance became essential to this country being here at all at, under the guy under the way it is now. America, the Union of States with a constitution that so far, this great experiment so far has worked out. Uh, most democracies don't work out as you, if you read history, you'll know they mostly don't. Uh, so please be determined that this one will. So Lincoln was, uh, uh, if you think about it, people used to call himself not His Excellency, but His Excellency. He went to school for nine months, formal education in terms of just lower grade schools. But he had a nearly photographic memory, and he had an unquenchable thirst to know things. His father used to uh, beat him when he would catch him being lazy. Being lazy back then on, on prairie farms was reading. Reading, if it wasn't reading, writing, arithmetic, if it was something like Aesop's Fables or the life of uh, Weems's Life of uh, Washington or some uh, or Treasure Island or something like that, that would be a waste of time when you could be doing any number of a hundred things on a farm that, that need doing. And uh, Lincoln said of his father, he taught me how to work hard, but he never taught me how to like it. And back then, if you were raised on a farm, it was from sunup to sundown, backbreaking, sunburned work. Uh, and not all the things on a farm now that could help you be a good farmer. It was all backbreaking, chopping trees, digging up uh, trunks of trees, cutting down corn stalks, making shingles, getting water, Chopping down fire, chopping firewood, building rail fences. I mean, I could be here for 15 minutes listing the things you had to do to be a farmer. And he wanted, he wanted nothing to do with physical labor as he grew older. As he grew older, he was, he was exposed to slavery in some forms when he went, took a boat back from New Orleans. He saw slaves chained together. And uh, he said to a friend of his that went with him down there, he goes, if I ever get a chance to hit that, thing, meaning slavery, I'm going to hit it hard, because he, he thought it uh, just just wrong, on, on a moral level, wrong. It, made, it, it was economically entrenched in the economies of the whole country, but it was wrong to him, and it stayed wrong to him, and increasingly it was wrong to him. But uh, I have some stories about his character. When he was young, he, the first speech he ever gave was he was nine years old. He jumped on a stump outside his church. Uh, and gave a speech on why we shouldn't kill ants. Because they, their life is as dear to them as your life is to you, and you shouldn't be killing them for the fun of it. Uh, later on, he, uh, he was in his cabin. This was back in uh, Indiana before he moved to Illinois, finally, as, as, a, as an adult. He uh, saw a bunch of turkeys walking by the cabin. He asked his mother, because his father was away, he asked his mother to take the gun off the mantelpiece and shoot turkey for dinner. And any prairie mother didn't have a refrigerator, wanted something fresh for the pot. So she goes, okay. So he takes the gun out, loads it, because every kid over the age of six years old knew how to load and shoot a gun back then, uh, in being in such potential conflict with the Native Americans as we, as we pushed westward. Uh, took, a, took an aim at the turkey, threw the kink in the log, pulled the trigger, pop, boom, blue smoke went everywhere. Puts the, puts the musket down, runs outside, and we would hope we would see what we see when we go to the shopping market, a nice plastic wrapped turkey, you know, no pin feathers, no anything, just gives all the gizzards out and everything to take home from that kid. Well, it wasn't that. It was a live creature flopping around, blood going everywhere, feathers going everywhere, and it's, it didn't die immediately. Uh, and it's flopping around, and he had to stand there uh, horrified of what he had done. It's not that what he had done was so bad that provided his mother food. He knew he did it because he wanted to. 
He wanted to kill the turkey. And that's what bothered him a great deal. And in his biography later on, before the election of 1860, he wrote, I never pulled trigger on game again. Now, he was not a member of PETA, all right? He, did, he slaughtered hogs because that paid 31 cents a day and chopping rails paid 25 cents a day. So he, in the, November, that was hog killing time, when you could leave the, 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 the carcasses outside around Thanksgiving time, they wouldn't rot. It wouldn't freeze solid. It was, a, it was like refrigerator time uh, of weather. So that was hog killing time. He got paid 31 cents. But he just didn't do it for sport. Didn't, didn't ever believe in that. Uh, he would walk by as a teenager, a bunch of kids putting hot coals on a, turkey, on a turtle shell. And he would go over there knowing he's, they're torturing this turtle. And he would you know, knock the coals off and put water in the turtle shell. But he wouldn't just scatter them and kick them and threaten to go to their parents or anything like that. He would sit down amongst them. This was a teachable moment for, for the kids. And Lincoln was, Lincoln was very good at this. He'd sit down in the leg fashion with his big knees sticking up in the air. Because by the time, when he was 16, he was six foot three and incredibly powerful for his age. And he would say to the kids, what are you doing? What were you doing with the turtle? Oh, we were trying to get the turtle to come out of the shell. Thinking a snail, you know, a snail finds a shell, uh, it goes in the shell, and you know how snails do that. So they think a turtle is like a shell, because it's living in a shell. Yeah, any of you ever seen a turtle come out of the shell? No. Any of your friends ever seen a turtle come out of the shell? No. That's because turtles don't come out of their shells. Their backbone's attached to the, to, the, uh, to the shell itself. It can't come out. So you were really kind of hurting the turtle. But you know what? It's his friends. Where would you find her? Across the creek? Across that creek? Yeah. I bet his friends are watching. And they don't want to have coals put on their backs. But they want to, meet, they want to see if their friend's OK. Why don't we take the turtle back? I'll take the turtle. I'll step over the creek and put the turtle back so his friends can find him. OK. Lincoln would do that and step across the creek with his huge legs and put the turtle back. And of course, all these six little kids would be jumping on Lincoln as he walks back. And Lincoln was so strong. People constantly wrote about this. They would see six or seven kids on Lincoln trying to bring him down. And Lincoln would be laughing like crazy. And these kids would remember it into old age. Because Lincoln loved kids and he loved finding teachable moments, especially regarding morality. Later on, he was about, still about 16, he walks in a front of us. Uh, he's walking home, and it's, the day started out like 40 degrees, and then it starts getting cloudy and colder, and they get that steel smell, the smell of, uh, uh, what is it, is it oh, uh, where is it? The thing comes in front of a front storm, I forget the, 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 the chemical, chemical name. Ozone. Ozone, thank you. And we smell, we smell that before either rain or, or a snowstorm's coming. And it starts to snow, and temperatures drop. And Lincoln sees the town drunk, which there's no not one town drunk. There's always more than one town drunk, because wherever you have a lot of corn, like on the prairie, Indiana and and uh, uh, Illinois, corn has to be harvested, and corn can't go to market as corn. Before the railroads came, you had to convert it into something else. Two things you had to convert corn to: pigs or whiskey. So whiskey was everywhere, and it was cheap. Pigs had the advantage they could walk themselves to market. Okay, So you had to convert this great abundance of corn into other things that could be used as currency. And they used whiskey and pigs to pay bills back then and, and due to a shortage of cash. So he sees this guy laying there, and, he, and Lincoln senses that this is going to be a snow. This is going to be a snow. People back then knew weather. They, could, they were outside a lot more than you guys are outside. And they, could, they had a much better sense of what weather is and, and can do and what's coming. Lincoln says, we got to take this guy back. And, he's, you know, and his friend goes, no, he's probably you know, wet himself. I'm not, I'm not picking that up. You know, he's been a drunk my whole life. I've seen it. He'll be fine. I'm, at, I'm gone. So his friend leaves. I'm friend. Lincoln picks him up from, from a dead, dead weight, picking him up under his hands like this. Walks him two miles to the cabin of the Armstrong's friend is. Knocks on the door. They open the door. They stay there. They don't need to ask. Number one, they see Abraham Lincoln. They know Abe. They know why he's there holding a drunk guy in his arms. And the snow falling down behind him. 
Bring him in, put him by the fire. Put him by the fire, put a blanket over him. And that guy got uh, alcoholic, which was not a word back then. An alcoholic would swear the rest of his life that, that, that Abraham Lincoln saved his life. He would do things like that. Uh, I'm going to go into, uh, I guess, one of my favorite stories of, of and by the way, I'm not doing all this. I spoke to uh, Mr. Martin before, and I'm going to cut a few of these here, but I, I want to go directly to the Manny Reaper case and the firing squad. Those of you who have ever uh, Googled a, what a Reaper is, the McCormick Reaper was a, I mean, there are several inventions that, you know, the telephone, the telegraph, the, uh, 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 the cotton gin, and the McCormick Reaper. Those are, those are hallowed inventions of the United States that changed social history and economic history in our country. The McCormick Reaper was basically a long metal contraption that one guy sat on and was pulled by about eight horses. And it had blades where it would cut wheat. And, it, and, it would, would be, and the wheat would be, be behind it as it moved. It, it eliminated about eight guys' jobs from doing that. So it was a great labor-saving device. Uh, I know, you know technology putting people out of work, even back then. Uh, but, it, but the Manny, the, the uh, McCormick, the, the guy who owned this company, McCormick, he was like an egomaniac cross between, forgive me, I don't want to go positive, but, but like a Donald Trump's ego and the, who's the, who's the owner of the Dallas Cowboys? Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones, okay? Never lose, never say die, smash mouth, football, no prisoners kind of guy. And this was McCormick. And what's the, what do you do? when you have a reaper contest in France. You have anybody, all, all comers are gonna have a reaper contest. Whoever could have a certain amount of acres and have the most amount of yield on those acres in the shortest amount of time. Well, it's always, the last couple of years it's been the McCormick Reaper Company. Not this year. In, in 1854, it was the Manny Company of Central Illinois, a much smaller company, had, for a time, a much better reaper. And so what do you do in a corporate America if somebody else beats you? You sue them for patent infringement. Then you go, go to law, law school, that's what you're going to be doing. Sue them for patent infringement. And you'll have, make a nice living at it, too. Uh, so there was a trial in central Illinois. Now, this is when Lincoln was a new, relatively new lawyer. And he, was, he gave talks, like I'd go around giving these history talks. He loved inventions. He's the only president with a patent. He patented a little wooden boat that, would, if it got stuck on a sandbar, these things with poles would come down and lift the ship off the sandbar. It never was built, it never was practical, but he's the only president with a, with a patent. So the problem was, it was going to be a trial in central Illinois, because both companies were in central Illinois, and Lincoln uh, was chosen to be on the dream team because Manny Company only had $25,000 and he spent it on the lawyers. This was the Hail Mary of corporate Hail Marys. They spent and they hired some of the most well-known, richest guys from the East and one of them was a guy named Edwin Stanton. Phi Beta Kappa, he went to law school, Lincoln didn't go to law school. There was only one law school west of the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, uh, and he didn't go there. He read, studied under another lawyer, and became a lawyer that way. Which is to say, he was, you know, fake it till you make it for, for a lot of years. So, but they, the, they know they'd be confronting a jury of farmers. And they don't know, and they might even not even like guys with gold watches and key fobs and co coaches outside and, and fancy titles and stuff. That might turn them off. So let's kind of diffuse that by having somebody local. So they, they debate, anybody local that's good that, you know, in Central Illinois, well, Lincoln, he, uh, he, he, he rode the Eighth Circuit with his, you know, riding three months of the fall, three months of the spring, riding around the whole Central State. He, he is well known. He's well liked, too. Let's get him on, on our side. They sent him a retainer check of $500, and they think they're hiring him because of his legal skill. They're only hiring him to be a potted plant sitting there on the bench 
saying hi to the people in the jury. Hey, Bill. Hey, Sam. How's the, how's the chickens been laying this, this uh, fall? Here? And that's the kind of thing they wanted Lincoln to do. Lincoln was still clueless. He was, once he hired, he went and went to, under discovery, you could go to the Manning Corporation, you could go to McCormick, you, uh, McCormick Reaper, you could draw pictures, you could, inter you could talk to the engineers, you could make your case under discovery where the court allowed you to basically do interview both sides. And he comes up with a legal brief about this that withdraws. But he also notices, he didn't really notice, they had a change of venue to get a fair trial. They thought they couldn't get a fair trial in central Illinois because everybody there knew or worked for or had an uncle working for or one of his companies. They moved the trial to Cincinnati, Ohio. So, they, so the jurors there would know nothing about who these players were. They didn't tell Lincoln about it, saying we don't need your services anymore. Lincoln still thinks he's hired because he's a good lawyer and he knows a lot about inventions. So he sees in the paper it's been moved to Cincinnati and the trial's going to start in two weeks. He's looking for telegrams. He goes to the telegraph office. He moves furniture around. He can't find a telegraph saying, by the way, Lincoln, meet us in Cincinnati. So he does the only thing he can think of. He goes to Cincinnati. He clears his schedule. He has his partner clear his schedule for a week and a half. He goes with a bag with bad sandwiches that Mary made him and a carpet bag and a hat and he, his one suit that's all sweat stained and crusty under the armpits because it's a black satin suit. And he looks like Herman Munster with his arms out like this because he never fit in any suit he ever wore. And so he shows up in the hotel, the, 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 the most expensive hotel in Cincinnati, and Stanton, Edwin Stanton, the short, little, brilliant, pugnacious, egomaniac guy, sees Lincoln. He goes, who's that? He goes, oh, the lawyer says, the other lawyer says, oh, that's Lincoln. I didn't telegram him not to come. Oh, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. So Lincoln goes up in his hotel room, and his, the other lawyer who hired him said, oh, go up, and we'll, we'll come for you later on. Meanwhile, they go to the judge's house. The judge is having dinner for both sides, the defense and prosecution. They have cigars and brandy, and that's what they did back then. The judge has both sides over the night before the trial. It's really weird. Lincoln's upstairs waiting, and finally, with enough liquor in him, the lawyer that hired him, that's really embarrassed, goes up to see Lincoln. Lincoln's sitting on his bed. And by the way, he had, Lincoln had given the guy the brief in the lobby when he first got there, hours before. He gets to the room. He sits down with Lincoln. He hands him, he hands him back the brief unopened. Unopened. He says, oh, look, I'm sorry. We really don't need you. It's been a change of venue. I'm sorry. To, yeah, check for $500 with him. Take, take this for all the work you've done. You clear your schedule. No, I can't take that. He goes, you have to take it. You're, you, you're taking a week and a half out, out of work. You did, you did the brief. You, you're very kind to us. And really thank you. You go know, to Mary. You go with your partner, your business partner, and your wife. They expect this check. OK, he finally takes the check. But any of us. Through, you know, would be insulted, our pride would be hurt, our vanity. We would get on the train probably, right? In the middle of the night, go back to Springfield, Illinois, go in the house, say to your wife, if you ever mention the, McC the McCormick Reaper Company or Edwin Stanton again, I'll leave you. Never mention it again. And you would lay in bed fuming at what life just did to you. It was your one big chance to accomplish something, the biggest case you were ever in. He didn't do that. He stayed. He says to himself, well, these are the best lawyers I've ever seen, or I ever will see. I'm going to stay and watch them. And he goes, it's a courthouse where there's a lot of trials going on. So he watches Stanton go to work. He, how organized he is, how he would address the judge respectfully, but how he would turn to the jury and use his glasses. He would say, yeah, use his glasses as a, as a tool to address the jury. Then sometimes he would turn and address the audience. And he was very organized in terms of his paperwork. And Lincoln's seeing all this. And during recesses, Lincoln's going across the hall seeing a divorce trial. Or he's going or seeing down the hall seeing a murder trial with that recess. And he's see, exposing himself to all these different lawyers with different cases. And he's realizing that he's not much of a lawyer yet. OK? It's a, it's a hard thing to learn. But he was determined to better himself and throw away this pride and ego. To, to avail himself of an opportunity. So if somebody sees him on the rail station going back to Springfield, they go, where are you going, Lincoln? He goes, I'm going home to study law. Some, some, someday these Eastern lawyers are going to come west 
and I've got to be ready for it. And I, basically, I'm not ready for it now. So remember Edwin Stanton. Later on, when Lincoln's president of the United States, and the South seceded, and now there's war, there's conflict, the nation's been torn apart, Lincoln goes, uh, Lincoln, uh, his secretary of war, the appointed, Simon Cameron, is a crook. And what do you do when you find out that the most important job you have in your, in your cabinet is a crook? You promote him. You, 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 pick, you look at the globe and you find the farthest away thing, and it's the, and it's the secretary, it's, it's the ambassador to Russia. So he flatters him, writes him a glowing letter, we need you in Russia right away. Your skills are too great. To, you know, he's really spreading a lot of you know what. And so Cameron takes the bait and now is secretary, uh, now ambassador to Russia. He's looking for a competent guy, preferably wealthy and can't be bought, because all these contractors want to buy him off. You know, hey, sign this contract and we'll cut you in on a deal. We need to see stock of the company. That happened all the time in Congress then. So he sees Edward Stanton on the list, who's a Democrat. Lincoln's a Republican. He's got a Republican Party coming. Edward Stanton, Democrat. He goes, that's Edward Stanton on the list? Bring him to me. Okay, you think he's going to get payback, right? Going to chew him out. He has Stanton in. He's brought up the path by a congressman who's who suggested him. Stanton comes in, they sit by the fire for two hours, talking about the war, how the tents, the, the, the soldiers are sleeping in, fall apart after the first rain, their shoes are falling apart, they're poorly shod, hence the term shoddy, that's where that comes from. Uh, so they talk for two hours, and, and Lincoln walks into the door, puts his two hands on his shoulder, and says, Mr. Stanton, I'm going to send your name to the Senate tomorrow for confirmation. Thank you very much. And he walks, this congressman walks him out in front of the White House, and Stanton turns to his, the congressman and goes, he never mentioned it. The congressman goes, never mentioned what? He goes, the McCormick Reaper case. He never mentioned it. He knows, he knows I threw him off the case. How, how, how can he do that? And the congressman goes, Mr. Lincoln is the worst hater you'll ever find. He doesn't hold grudges when there's a job to be done. You could help him. He knows it. You'll be good together. Uh, my last story before we get into uh, uh, something uh, uh, we, we talked about is, uh, Mr. Miller, we talked about, uh, so now it's 1864 and Lincoln is in the White House. The war's been going on. He's not, he's losing weight. He's highly stressed. The war would eventually cost 700,000 lives of a country of 23 million people. Those of you who had grandfathers or in, the, in the World War II, maybe, great-grandfathers in World War II, one out of every 40 people was a casualty. Casualty was killed, wounded, or missing in uniform. Killed, wounded, or missing is a casualty. In the Civil War, it was one out of five. It was incredibly searing devastating event in American history. As Bruce Catton, the historian, said, it was our Iliad and our Odyssey as a country. And so Lincoln, to get public opinion, he would take his, what he called his public opinion baths. Two days a week, he'd let anybody come up the stairs and talk to him to give him a piece of their mind. And that's why he gauged what was going on with the people. Because the, the, bi the, the uh, newspapers were incredibly biased. So one day, uh, an old man comes in, old man probably my age, if not younger. He's got a file, and his son is scheduled to be shot for desertion. Now, Lincoln tried to find any mitigating circumstances. He read every case, capital case he could, to try to find something that would spare this person's life. He always said, I think soldiers could do more above ground than below ground for our country. So he sees his file, he goes over, he sits at the table, and he's looking it through the file with, the, with his lawyer's uh, to try to find something. Now, that, now, here's his problem. All the generals have been, are mad at him because anytime he pardons somebody, the generals think they're losing discipline on the front. So the people, oh yeah, yeah. So no one's going to be shot. Lincoln will pardon you. So they basically hurry up and try to shoot these people before Lincoln can find word of it. So it's kind of like a rat race like that now. So Lincoln's looking through this thing and he, he finds something that wasn't right in in the trial. 
he looks at the man and he, and he, and he goes, he writes, goes over, writes him a note, hands the man a note, going, give this to the jailer, uh, the, the, the warden of the, uh, the prison, and your son will be okay. It's the father's crying. He looks at the note. He goes, but this won't free my son. Lincoln goes, read what it says, sir. Read what it says. And he goes, I, you can't see through the tears. I, I don't understand. He's like, this time, not let my son come home. Lincoln takes the note. He reads it. Dear warden, do nothing with this prisoner until you hear from me. A. Lincoln. Do you understand what's going on here, sir? They're never going to hear from me. I'm never going to write to that warden again. Yet he's going to be ordered to do nothing with this prisoner until you hear from me. What that does is it doesn't give a pardon that the generals would be upset about. He finds a, a political way to thread the needle, to keep the kid alive till the end of the war, and then there'll be general pardons, and hundreds of these guys will go home to their families. So the guy wants to hug Lincoln, ah, that's enough. So Lincoln, uh, the guy walks out, and he says to Nikolay, his secretary, well, let's close up shop, Nikolay, he takes his suspenders off. And Nikolay asks a question he soon regret, regrets. He goes, Mr. President, why do you, why do you keep handling and, 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 and not letting these people that, that have been, have been uh, convicted by a court's martial to be shot? The generals are going to be mad at you. He goes, well, it he goes, well, it reminds me of a pig. And Nikolay's like, oh, no, another story from Lincoln. He goes, he goes when I was riding, well, back in, on, in uh, Illinois, when I was riding the circuit, you had to ride to get court cases every little town in the world to get three or four court prints. He goes, I was going, I was late for court. I had to ride cross lots, meaning you had to ride over fields, not by roads, because the roads go like this. And he has to make time. He's got a rented horse. He's going straight across the fields to where he knows he's got to be. So he goes across this field and he sees a pig stuck in the mud. I mean, really stuck in the mud, like no hope to get out kind of mud. Now, there's only a couple of ways that, that the end is going to be that it's going to be picked apart by wolves or dogs, sunstroke, the crows are going to pick at it, and it's not going to, it's going to or starve to death or die of thirst. It's not going to be an easy death. And Lincoln also knew that no one else is coming by. But he had to make money for Mary. He only had one suit of clothes on. So he rides to it like the top of the hill, and he says to Nikolai, when I get to the top of the hill, I can feel that pig looking at me, the back of my head. I can feel it. And the pig's saying, no one else is coming by. There goes my last hope. That guy, that guy is my last hope. And he goes, that, when that old man was sitting here looking at me, I, looked, I glanced up as I was reading his son's file, and he was staring at me. Just like I just I could feel him staring at me, just like I knew that pig was staring at me. And they're both like, there goes my last hope. So what Lincoln did was he went back, was late for trial, missed, missed the court case, missed the fee, got all the money, got the pig out. Then Lincoln, thinking the story's over, he goes to his little cubby hole around the corner, and Lincoln follows him. He goes, but you know, Nikolai, I didn't do it for the pig. I did it for me. I didn't want to have to go through the rest of my life knowing that with a war just about to end, or ending soon, that I could have done something. I don't want to be haunted like that. I, I could have done something back then. So as he, before we get into the next, the last part of the discussion, I think I'd like to channel the president on his birthday. And what he probably would like to get across to you is, especially in this student body, which is very unique, uh, is Lincoln's asking you to get mud on your pants. You're very busy. You will, be, you will be even busier the older you get. You will have tons of things to do. But take the time. Miss a couple bucks. Miss the court case to help some, an animal, a person, a cause. to get mud on your pants. Now we're going to switch to something that... Uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, Abraham Lincoln and his evolving view of slavery. He could not have been elected president in 1860 if he were an abolitionist. If he believed immediately that slavery was wrong, he did believe slavery was wrong, but that they should be freed immediately. And maybe under his War Powers Act, that only kicks in during time of war, he might have gotten away with it. 
But there would have been mass desertions from the army. Northerners would have thrown their guns down and said, we didn't sign up to free the N-words. That's not what we signed up for. We signed up to, to, to unify the country. And there would have been, the war effort would have ended immediately or would have been impacted where basically a third of the army would, would go home. And, but so the, Lincoln was also very big in timing. He would, he, his time, political timing was brilliant. He gave the analogy once of, hey, do you like a pear? There's a pear hanging from a tree up there, but it happens to be June. Pears don't ripen in June. So you climb the tree, you grab this pear, it's as hard as a cannonball. You try to pull up the stems like an iron wire attached to the tree. You wind up pulling it, you, you strip the tree of the bark, and it still wouldn't give. And you have to take out your pen knife and cut the bark, and now you've got the pear. You go down, you climb down the ladder, you bite into it, and one of your teeth is sticking in it, and there's blood all over the pear because it's rock hard. Or you can wait till the first week of September and climb that same tree, and you touch it, it's all like squishy, and then you go, you just give it a little pluck, comes right off, you go down, you take, take it down the ladder, and you lean over, like the only way to eat a pear in the summer, you lean over so you get all over you, and you bite into this deliciously soft, juicy fruit. Timing is everything, political timing. He knew that he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He also believed early on that slaves should be given the opportunity of being colonized someplace else, going back to Africa, their home continent. But what was, real, what was realized soon after he met with African American leaders is some of the African Americans' families have been in this country much longer than the, the people who owned them. A lot of the, the uh, Scotch Irish came over in the, in the you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, and the slaves had been there for generations before. So they didn't think it was a good idea, so Lincoln had to drop that idea. But yet, how did slaves get free? First of all, when the war started, thousands of slaves were coming through the lines, into the army lines. And early in the war, the officers turned them back, gave them back when their slave owners came looking for them. They gave them back to their slave owners because they had no orders to the contrary. So finally, Benjamin Butler, who was a lawyer general, said, let's treat them as contraband. Contraband of war. Since, since they're things, right, they're property, we could, we could hold on to, in that times of war, we could hold on to property that benefits the South. See, all, a lot of white soldiers were at the front because the, the crops were being grown by slaves back home. So let's deny them this source of support by holding them contraband and putting them to work. Now, they, granted, they, they were given uniforms, they were in the army, but they would dig graves, they would bury horses, they would chop wood, they would corduroy roads, putting logs down so wagons go over. They were doing everything but being in the army. What helped them actually get muskets was the fact that the war was not going well. And thousands, oh, they turned my phone off, which I thought I did. Uh, uh, thousands of soldiers a white soldiers were dying, filling up the, 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 the dying of diseases. And they needed, if they could, Lincoln argued, if they could harness that manpower, manpower military manpower, and have all these, these uh, 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 bl uh, blacks, blacks that it really had nothing to do. The army had all the wood choppers and all the water gatherers they needed, but eventually there were hundreds of thousands of black soldiers with muskets that would go, go to war and help turn the tide against the South in terms of just crushing manpower. And yes, they manned forts, they guarded bridges, but some of them actually made it into frontline combat troops, and they fought very well. The biggest complaint Grant had about them when they were fighting outside Petersburg is when you ordered them to halt after an assault, they wouldn't halt. They kept on going. The white guys held, stayed. So they said, blow the bugle, halt? Okay, every halt. Who are those guys? Like, like uh, they, they called USCT, U.S. Colored Troops. They would, they would not want to stop. So eventually, uh, the abolitionist movement 
gain strength. Like, like things, things gain strength a lot. Like uh, the, the, the women's movement in the 19, you know, even from 1848 Seneca, Seneca Falls to uh, the 1960s, 1970s, now with the Me Too movement. It's, you figure, well, well why has this taken so long? It's just 2018 for there to be really laws in Congress that Congress people can't be doing these things that are interns? Why did it take so long? That's, history sometimes takes a long time to do the right thing, and, and, and even with, with slavery. So Lincoln proposed a, the 13th Amendment of the Constitution to give permanently, to rip out of the Constitution, I think it's a 5 eighths percent, isn't it? Uh, 5 eighths, there were 5 eighths of people? I think there were. What was it? I was always there. Uh, whatever that percentage was, thank you, uh, that they are real people. And, if it, and it would take a lot longer for them, it would take until 1950 for them to, to be integrated in with white soldiers in the U.S. Army. 1950. It, it, would, it would take gays eventually into the in, in 1980s to under, don't, you know, don't tell, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't promise, what was it? Yeah, and eventually that, and now we have LGBT soldiers in in the military, and that took a long time coming. So, so the wheels of the wheels of justice, and, and, and it turned slowly. But Lincoln was very effective in becoming an abolitionist and helping to free a people. Uh, the the last thing I, I would probably say before we go to Q and A is. I read an article about how everybody wants to be happy. Just you interview parents. What do you want for your children? I want them to be happy. That wouldn't be the answer 150, 200 years ago. It would be I would like them to be of service to the world and to, to the community. Uh, this was Lincoln in 1860, before he grew a beard, just, just before he started growing a beard. Five years later, he looked like this. Five years. Stress, lack of food, lack of sleep, death tolls. You see in vision, he said, I envision sometimes the root after chances over. I could see the blood filling this room with the, with the death of soldiers. He was haunted by the war that he knew he had to fight. A very peaceful man, but he, that's the great paradox of, of freeing the people in the United Country. Sometimes it's at the point of a ban. So, uh, but the reason I, I used to, this used to be my worst picture of Lincoln. I used to not even like this. I used to take regard for that a month before he died. It was assassinated. It's now my favorite picture of Lincoln. What do you see in this picture? Yeah, he's smiling. He's smiling. All the other pictures of Lincoln you'll see, he's not even attempting to smile. Here he is, and some people say he anticipated his own death. Here he is, giving a smile of satisfaction. The 13th Amendment had just been, had just been passed. Hundreds of deserters were coming over the Confederate lines every night now. He knew that Lee was down to about 35,000 guys coming from Petersburg and Richmond when, when Grant had 120,000 men waiting for him to try to break and make a run for it. And eventually, they captured, captured Lee's army, what was left of it, at Appomattox Court. This man died a fulfilled person. And uh, we owe a great deal of gratitude to him on his birthday. So happy birthday, Mr. President. Now let's do some q and history and I like American history and you can't read any part of American history without eventually stumbling across this big vortex. And all the things swirling around it are from today back to the colonization movement and the vortex that was swirling around is the American Civil War, which was set in motion by the Constitution. That, that couldn't be passed unless they dealt with slavery in the Constitution, which set in motion that very long realization, increasing 
realization that slavery is, is, is wrong. Some in the South thought it was a good. They, 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 each side quoted the Bible to support their slavery and how they treated women. They, you know, was, they, you know, the, the man determines is the, is, is the superior of women in marriage, and they, and they, they did it with uh, slavery as well. So whenever you have both sides, both Christian sides, quoting from the Bible to support the cause, that ain't good. You know things are going to get ugly quick. There's never been an uglier fight than between like brothers. You know, just, so, uh, but my love of history comes from uh, just a realization that this great experiment in democracy is very fragile. And it's very fragile. Uh, although Lincoln said, no enemy army will ever water their horses in the Ohio River to conquer us because we're so strong and determined people will never let a foreign country get that far inland and, not, and, and us not defeating them. But he goes, the only way we will die is by suicide. That suicide is in many forms. Debt, that's one, one way that no, pol no politician has yet grasped. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Okay, yeah. What do you think about Abraham Lincoln and the self-made Could you yell it out, Linda, please? Yes. Um, so what do you think about Abraham Lincoln and the self-made So he's often portrayed as a very humble figure, but like humility was his one very great character. But at the same time, he was also very opportunistic and um, ambitious. So. He, he was ambitious. Ambition is kind of a, um, you can either be good ambitious or bad ambitious. Uh, uh, he was the good ambition. He was ambitious because he felt he could. He saw things way ahead of time. He, his friends, on law, uh, friends traveling with him back in the early 1850s, would see him sit up at night, hugging his knees, just kind of like rocking and thinking, and he would have a look, uh, uh, just a look of such sadness over his face. He saw what was coming. He saw that that what was set in motion, and getting worse by the year, was a terrible war. But he was a self-made person. He was very confident in himself. The, the, his own party, when he, and the Democrats, when, he, when Lincoln became president, they thought they were going to turn this guy into a James Polk, some puppet president. And there's been a lot of puppet presidents in our history. And they thought this is going to be the most puppet president we ever had. I mean, he talks with this Western twang. He, he clothes don't fit him. He looks like a pencil neck geek. Uh, you know, he didn't go to school. And yet he blocked a lot of things personally and with his cabinet that the, the, con Congress, uh, the Congress thought they would be able to uh, bowl over it, and the generals too. And he was defiant. He, he, didn't, he didn't yell. He didn't uh, uh, brag about himself. Eventually, he started out saying, you know, my party or my cabinet, my administration, but very soon, even Seward, who didn't like him in the beginning, his Secretary of State, hit Seward's wife, knowing his husband didn't like Lincoln, would write letters bad-mouthing Lincoln. And eventually, by 1862, Seward wrote to his wife, no, my dear, don't talk about him, don't, don't write about him that way, he's the best of us. So Lincoln was winning over his cabinet of brilliant, experienced business people, most of them very wealthy, and Lincoln had to, you know, borrow money to come to, to Washington to, to get a couple suits to come to Washington. Yet Lincoln, through his power and his, his character and his willpower, guided his cabinet and got, if you figure, a bunch of horses that didn't get along. How, how would you want a Quaker in your cabinet and a slave owner like Blair in your cabinet? How, how why would you put all these this, different men in your cabinet that might not get along, and he got them to work together. He, he like hitched those horses to you know, the harness and got them to pull this thing to win the war. He was, he was incredible. If you're going to read one book, it David Donald's Lincoln. It's a one volume history of Lincoln, and I urge you at some near point in time to get that book and read it. It's in paperback, you get it on Amazon. And then after that, if you like that, 
t a team of rivals, which talks about how Lincoln appointed his political rivals and put them in a cabinet. Um, Ma'am? I teach U.S. history, mm -hmm. and I try and um, impress upon students that there's no president, no person, that is free of flaws. Free of what? I'm sorry. Free of flaws. Oh, right, right. And it's, it's hard to find flaws in Lincoln. I mean, there certainly were some. What would you say were, was a mistake that he made? Or oh, there were the, the whole... Uh, uh, voluntary uh, resettlement. That was it. Was he thought it was a good idea at the time? I said it a lot. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but he he didn't he didn't know a lot of black leaders to talk to. Him. He had a, finally invited them in 1862 to the White House to discuss this, and he got the he got the unmistakable opinion that they thought this was a bad idea. So he know if he couldn't sell it to them, he's going to drop the subject. Sometimes what you think is a good idea is not a, po a political good idea. He, when he first, the mistake he made was, when he first came to the White House, he would authorize battleships to like re resupply Fort uh, Pulaski, uh, Pens in Pensacola, and reinforce, the same ships were ordered twice to reinforce Sumter and another fort, which couldn't happen, and, and he didn't realize that that was the Navy Department's job to order ships around. These were rookie mistakes. Um, he did. He lived with his mistakes too. You know, Mary was essential. But you can say, "Well, oh, Mary was crazy, and, and, and she was a very difficult, odd woman for sure." But he loved her, and, and she believed in him. If, you know, if it wasn't for Abigail Adams believing in John and Mary Lincoln believing in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in Abigail, whatever, wherever they were, in, in, in Abigail believing in John then these people wouldn't have been able to, to be, have the time and dedication to go do, to John Adams spend all the time in Washington, and for Lincoln, what woman would say, oh, go ahead, honey, go talk politics and not make any money in law. It's just that we've got three kids back home. But, if, but you, have a destiny, you have a destiny, you go do and bring, make half as much money as you would if you weren't in politics. Because she believed he had a destiny. She said to her friends when they were first courted, he's going to be president of the United States someday. And they, the girls, the women started laughing. And she looked at them like, what are you laughing at? And they looked at her like she was serious, so they stopped laughing. Because they thought they knew Mary was serious. She thought this guy had a destiny. And she was going to sacrifice for him. Thank goodness. Or, Do you believe, had he lived, that African Americans would not would be able to have the franchise well before general in the South, well before the 1960s. In other words, could he have pulled off an equitable reconstruction? Well, we know that reconstruction, as was then, that the troops stayed in the major cities and the smaller cities in the South till late, till 1877. I think Lincoln would have been dead by then. So it all depends on when do you think he would die. I think he was, I think John Wilkes Booth did a coup de grace on him. That he basically, you know, he, the, the war killed him. It's just that John Wilkes Booth ended his mortal life. Um, that being said, I think Lincoln would have been a moral power uh, if, he, if he served out his term. It was off the political stage um, by 68. Uh, but he still would have been a moral force if he was alive. He would be writing and, and touring and lecturing. And he would be planning to visit his wife, Mary, insisted that they go visit all the heads of state and the grand tour of the world for two years. And he would be, you know, feted and given praise and honors like you couldn't believe. Uh, and he would have been there to help blacks get get the vote. And not, and not ridiculous like voter... Uh, you know, uh, tests, uh, you know, uh, spell, you know, uranium or spell anti-disestablishmentarianism and then you wrote, you know, that, those kind of stupid things. Uh, he would have fought that tooth and nail. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't around uh, 
And, and Grant wasn't also, as, as a president in the, in the 1870s, he wasn't that much of a, an abolitionist. Sherman was. Sherman definitely was not. Uh, he, he did, Sherman didn't like all these, you know, after Aaron's hanging around his army and stuff. He, he lamented the fact that it was even involved in what the war was about. Sherman wanted to keep it, hey, reunite, reunite the country. Uh, so it, it is an interesting what if. I, and I do think it would have been better for black Americans, but, you, but social, there, there's a great quote that seems paradoxical. There's a woman that was quoted in most of the history books. She goes, I hate slavery, but I hate ends. Worse. What did she just say? I hate slavery, but I hate the N word more. There's, there was an ambiguity through most of America, North and South, that even during World War II, when a lot of the, the jobs for the war plants in the North, there were 45 major race riots in the United States during World War II. Ain't your history book. But, but they just basically, because they couldn't, they weren't allowed to live near the factories. They weren't allowed to take the transportation that whites were on to, to get to the jobs. So it was, it, was, it, it was just constant conflict and sparks flying between the races for a long, long time. Um, I asked my father during, you know, because you know, my father was in World War II, and I would ask him all these history questions. I'd go, did you ever notice like water fountains for blacks only and, and, and your, or for coloreds? They call them coloreds back then. Do you ever notice those kind of bathrooms and, and, and water fountains? He goes, yeah. He, goes, he didn't give it a moment's thought in terms of what. My father never said the N word or the F word his entire life to me. He's a very, very moral, good guy. Tough sergeant you know, in the, in the uh, Air, Army Air Corps. And I go, did you ever? Think about that? He goes, no. I just, we just, I just accepted it because that's the way it was. And that's how most people do until, it, until consciousness awakens to say, that shouldn't happen. We shouldn't be dump, dumping toxic water in the Cuyahoga River that, that ignited on fire. A river caught fire back in the early 1970s. That's wrong. It's wrong how we treat women. It's wrong how we treat animals. It, it, it takes a, a rising consciousness to reach that point. And, and Lincoln had to reach that point. And he helped the country reach that point. 